appreciate the uh, the opportunity to be here once again. This is uh, one of one of the events I really enjoy is coming here to uh, to Waynesville St. Robert. But um, a little bit more about me. So my district includes all of Texas County, uh, roughly the southern one third of Phelps, and then on the Pulaski County side. So if you think of where Forney Field is on the fort, the district boundary crosses right there, but then it kind of takes a jog to the north. And uh, actually, the Highway 28 corridor, Devil's Elbow, uh, kind of by the Road Ranger truck stop in the Jerome area, that's uh, mine as well. Claudia Sands, so she is actually not only a very good friend, and it breaks my heart to hear the news, but uh, she's also one of my constituents. Uh, anyone else here that would happen to know if you are or are not one of my constituents? Would you Okay, I've got a, got a handful back here, but uh, very good. Um, but then I also have in Northern Howe County, I've got what's known as the Goldsbury Township. It surrounds the city of Mountain View. So really I've, you know, don't by any stretch have one of the bigger house, the biggest house districts, but it is fairly large and it's hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes, uh, you know, north to south, uh, depending on how you're going. But uh, this is my seventh year of serving as a representative in the legislature, which means I'm term limited. Uh, so basically next year uh, for this event will be the, the last time that I'll have the opportunity to come here and, and speak to you in, that, in this capacity. But uh, in that seven years, and I'm just going to tell you, it's, uh, it's always, it's a rough experience to ever try to follow Steve Lynch when you're talking. <laughs> uh, I don't have any China stories, that's, uh, that's for sure. But uh, I've been on the budget committee for the past seven years. That's one of the things that has taken up a considerable amount of my time. And, you know, some of the things that have been talked about, I wanted to, to give you a better understanding of the process, what goes into to serving on that budget committee, and what we look at. And so the budget with the state government, it actually begins, uh, and I've got, I actually worked in Rolla for eight years for the state, uh, prior to quitting to be able to file and run to be a state representative. So I knew it from this side. So it begins, the state budget begins with the department request. The departments all get together, and here's what they need, and they present this to the governor. And that occurs in about October that time frame. Then, uh, once the governor and his staff have the opportunity to go through and kind of weed out, this is gonna work, this is not, uh, then we get the governor's recommendations, basically in the mid-January to January 20th time frame, when the governor gives his state of the state. That is when we receive what the governor has planned for the state budget. At that point, we begin the hearings, we discuss all of the governor's recommendations in comparison with the department requests. And I don't know if any of you have went online, Facebook, Twitter, and seen some of the stacks. I mean, from the floor, basically, the stack of books that we go through in this, you know, $29, $30 billion budget is, you know, four and a half to five feet tall. It uh, is pretty laborious. Line by line, page by page, you know, what is this for? Why does it matter? Who does it impact? How are your tax dollars being used or proposed to be used? And so then once we go through the governor's uh, recommendations, we then in the House, all budget bills, all appropriation bills start out in the House. And so those bills are filed, they're bills one through 13, which are filed by the House budget chair. And once those bills are filed, then we go through the committee process. So we've had all of these meetings, basically from the beginning or mid January through early March, we now have these bills, then changes are made to these bills in the committee process, the House Budget Committee. I should have also mentioned that we have subcommittees of the budget, which are known as appropriations committees in the House. Uh, I serve on Conservation, uh, Department of Natural Resources, and Ag uh, Approach Committee. But then it, the budget is in the full budget committee, changes are made, and then once those changes are made, then the budget goes to the floor of the House. There is, again, an opportunity for changes to be made to the budget through amendments on the floor. And then once we agree to that, we make the, all the final changes, we send that budget over to the Senate. It then begins the process over again. It has to go, once again, to the Appropriations Committee that Senator Brown talked about, in which they're going back through this line by line uh, to determine if you know that's the best use and changes are made through amendments in that committee. After the Senate Appropriations Committee, it then goes to the full Senate floor, where changes are potentially once made again. After that process, you've got a basically a House product and you've got a Senate product of what the budget should look like, and those differences have to be ironed out in a process known as conference committee. Now this happens over the last two, three weeks of session. Um, it's constitutionally mandated not only uh, that we have that budget done, 
but then also, as the Senator mentioned, that it's a it's constitutionally required in uh, the state of Missouri for it to be a balanced budget. Uh, the federal government ought to try that out, by the way. But uh, anyway, so once we've ironed out all these differences, then we go back through and the House and the Senate then go to truly agree and finally pass the budget. Uh, it is a, a long, extremely time-consuming pro uh, process, but uh, you know that's that's the way things work. And as uh, you know, Representative Lynch mentioned, you know we have a process legislatively across the state that, frankly, is designed to fail legislation. Uh, it is designed to fail. It's designed to be difficult. It's hard to get things through. The reason for that is this: because were it easy to to pass a bill to change statutory law. We would live as a society in a constant state of chaos. You wouldn't know what the laws were because they'd be fluid from one year to the next. And so it is very difficult. It takes a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of communication, cooperation to get some of this stuff passed. And uh, it is a very difficult process. But uh, also some of the other things that, that I've been involved with, with this year, uh, I'm the only member of the House to chair two separate committees. I chair the uh, Committee on Professional Registration and Licensing which doesn't sound like much until you start to think about what all that impacts and whether you know doctors, nurses, physical therapists, physician's assistants, uh, surveyors, engineers, uh, cosmetology, all of these different things set under the umbrella of the 43, 45 different occupations that we license as a state. And so if any change in statutory law is going to occur uh, relative to one of these professions, you know, that's going to come through me. And it's been a, a very educational process. I mean, obviously, I, you know, had this is kind of my bread and butter uh, on the professional registration side, but there's the breadth is so large when you start talking about all these other things and occupations that, you know, you have to get educated on. You have to get up to speed and you've got to know what is this proposal that is before me today? Is it going to help my constituents or hurt my constituents? Is it going to make living here and working here easier or more difficult, more burdensome? And so, um, that's the you know some of the different litmus tests that we have to look at but uh, with that uh, we, we made some uh, you know through that committee we spent a lot of time working on uh, APRNs nurse practitioners uh, removing some of the, the mileage requirements so they're still being collaborative agreements uh, however to, to make it easier I mean expanding access to rural health care uh, on the physical therapist side of things to make that where Currently, if you need physical therapy, you have to go to a physician and you're gonna to have to get a prescription to then go see a physical therapist. Uh, that bill passed out of the committee, uh, which would allow you direct access to go to a physical therapist. And, and I hesitate to tell you about some of these things because some of these things, we spent a considerable amount of time working on this, but they didn't make it over the finish line. And so some of these things we're gonna to have to revisit in this coming year uh, to work on these again. Um, we also, uh, Derek Dreyer, uh, he had some legislation dealing with um, some of the offenses and, you know, if you're an individual, you know, maybe you've got a troubled past, but then you're, you know, one of the most difficult things as a troubled individual is not being able to re-enter the workforce because of, you know, prior offenses. And so we've had to take a really hard look at, you know, what are some of the things that actually should preclude someone from you know, working in a professional field. Maybe if you're, uh, you know, I don't know, a CPA that embezzled from one of your clients, um, but then, you know, how long is enough? Is it five years, is it 10 years? And frankly, some of these different boards of professional registration should be able to, to tell you that. If you're looking at uh, getting into a profession, if you've got a, a prior conviction of some sort, you ought to be able to solicit that board and say, hey, I've got this in my past. If I go through, if I do the educational requirements, if I have the, the work requirements, is that gonna be enough? Will I be able to apply and, and receive a license at that point if I complete everything else satisfactorily? Uh, those are some other issues that we worked, uh, worked really hard on. Uh, one of the other issues uh, is license reciprocity. And this is one of the things that I know Representative Lynch, Senator Brown uh, have both filed legislation on, uh, but once again, it's a difficult process and this is where it takes, it really is a team effort. We have to work together because, you know, I don't care whether you're, you're Donald Trump, Governor Parson, Senator Brown, Representative Lynch, me, or anyone else, no individual on their own can make that large of an impact. It absolutely takes us working together. This reciprocity for veterans and our families when they move here, maybe they were a nurse in an adjoining state somewhere or some other state. 
when they come here, they shouldn't have to start at square one to begin that licensing process. And so, you know, we've got to look at the different requirements and, and get this set up. But I know that was one of the things that I was proud to work with these guys on that we didn't get across the finish line either. And I, I was doing my part. I heard the bill as soon as I could. Uh, I was putting that particular bill on other licensing bills or omnibus bills, as they're called, uh, to try to get it across the line. It was just one of those things that didn't work out. Uh, the other committee that I chair is uh, Committee on Government Oversight. How many people heard about the Department of Revenue and the issues with taxes and withholdings and state revenues and all that? Uh, yeah, a lot of that was because of me. Uh, because, well, not, that's the, not the department, but the, the uh, friction with the department. That was because of me, because it really frustrated me that the director, Joe Walters, was the uh, previous director, no longer director. Uh, there was an absolute lack of communication in, in how this was going to work. They changed the withholding tables. And so you have sort of a, a random side to this issue, and that was some of the, the, the amount of tax, um, you know, liability that a person, your ultimate liability has went down due to the Tax Cut and Jobs Act by uh, the Trump administration and then legislation that we had passed at the state level. Your ultimate liability would have went down. But how are you going to be convinced of that when, based on the withholding amount that you paid along the way, to meet that ultimate liability if it was lower and then you had to write a bigger check. It was, a, it was very complicated, a lot of moving parts. But then as was mentioned earlier, um, this relates back to budget, back to our state revenue. The systematic side, when you start talking about the amount that is withhold, withheld from uh, the 3.6 million taxpayers that we have in the state on a, on a weekly basis or monthly basis, that, that adds up. And so that, um, the amount of revenue we were really concerned heading into the last uh, two months of session, because as we mentioned before, at some points there we were three, four hundred, you know, two hundred. The dailies would fluctuate around, but uh, we were considerably underwater. Uh, we're now above and you know getting very close to what is known as the CRE, the consensus revenue estimate. But uh, at any rate, it was it was very concerning. But uh, with that, uh, it's great to have a governor that uh, knows about and supports agriculture. Uh, we, we, you know, pushed a really big ag bill this year and was able to get it across the finish line, and uh, that's going to be really important to our area. But with that, I'm going to be the shortest one to talk today, uh, and I'm going to save up more time for questions later. It's uh, an honor and a privilege to serve, and if I can help any one of you out on any issue, uh, I would encourage you to contact my office. Thank you.